Well, welcome to the 700 Club. President Trump may soon recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and move the U.S. Embassy to the Holy City. This is just one of the important issues CBN's David Brody talked about with Vice President Mike Pence in an exclusive interview. The vice president also discussed the wave of sexual harassment scandals and whether or not Congress will be able to get tax reform done by Christmas. Here's part one of David's interview. As he walked into the picturesque library at the U.S. Naval Observatory, we had quite a bit to ask the vice president. One huge topic, Israel. Specifically, would the president move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? He promised during the campaign to do so, but has held off. Senior White House sources tell CBN News discussions are underway to figure out a way to do it. In the meantime, there are now reports that initially the president could announce the U.S. will recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital city. But the president and I believe that um, uh, the relationship between the American people and, and the people of Israel is one that is timeless. I mean, literally before the founding of this country, there were Americans who prayed for and dreamed of Israel returning to its ancient homeland. And through the tragedy and tragic events of World War II and the Holocaust and through strong American leadership at the United Nations, Israel was restored to her homeland, as the old book says, in a day, in a moment. And uh, I know the president is reflecting on the decision about our embassy and other policies, but it's all informed by, uh, by his commitment uh, to the relationship between the United States and Israel and his knowledge uh, that the American people cherish our ally Israel and we always will. All of this will grow even larger when the VP heads to Israel and Egypt later this month. If the world knows nothing else, the world should know this. Under President Donald Trump, America stands with Israel and we'll be delivering that strong message. Uh, it was 70 years ago that the nation of Israel, in a miracle of history, came back into ex existence in its ancient homeland, and every day Americans have cherished that accomplishment, and we'll, we'll be there to celebrate that. But as we travel through the region as well, we'll, we'll also reaffirm our, our commitment to uh, uh, you know, peace in the region. The President's made it clear that we want peace, but people should know that uh, President Donald Trump will never compromise the safety and security of the Jewish state of Israel in the midst of that process. I'll also be traveling to Egypt uh, where we'll be, uh, we'll be talking about uh, the issue of, uh, of persecuted Christians and religious minorities across the wider Arab world. Uh, I, I couldn't be more proud of the fact uh, that uh, in the wake of seeing half of the Christian population uh, flee from Syria, 80% uh, of the Christian population has now left Iraq. That President Trump uh, made the decision to now begin to funnel U.S. support, not through the United Nations in every program, but, but for the first time directly through USAID to help rebuild Christian communities and the communities of other religious minorities that have for too long been neglected. Will that start soon? The, we're, we're, we're hoping to make announcements uh, okay. during my trip through the region, David. Here at home, the issue of sexual harassment has gripped the nation. It's something the vice president hasn't really discussed at length publicly, at least until now. So many people want to know, what's the solution? What's the answer? Uh, what's, where's the morality in all of this in terms of what can be done? Do you legislate it? Is it a cultural issue? What, what are some, can you help folks with some answers here about what's been, a uh, light has been shined on this topic, on this very important issue? Well, as, as vice president and as the father of two really talented and wonderful young women, uh, I think we're seeing real progress in our society today. Uh, every American woman is entitled to a safe and, and productive workplace. And, and my heart goes out uh, to the women who have endured sexual harassment in the workplace, and I admire their willingness and their courage in coming forward. But I think it's initiating a national conversation about practices in our businesses and in our public institutions that'll make sure that women and men uh, have, have the kind of work environment uh, that's, that, is, that is safe and, 
and respectful to all concerned. And I think the president and I both see that as progress. What do you make exactly of, and you're not one to take a victory lap, but you got, you got beat up on, you know, they called it the Pence rule, and then Billy Graham even before that, you know, just this idea of a, making sure you're, you're taking the proper steps to not have perception, and he's, you know, the perception becoming reality. What, what is your, your view of that? Because you got beat up in the media pretty well for that. Well, God's greatest blessing in my life uh, is my wife, Karen. And uh, look, every, every marriage is different. And when we got married 32 years ago, we sat down and talked to one another about guidelines. Um, and uh, we live those out in our life, and they've, they've been a blessing to us. And, uh, uh, and I, I have to tell you, I, uh, you know, criticism comes with a job, uh, and we accept that. But I, I've been very moved. Uh, over the last few months by how many people have stopped me as I've traveled around this country and, uh, and, and given me a word of encouragement and expressed uh, support for uh, our decision to put our marriage and our family first. And, and I, 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 uh, I'm always blessed by that. I really am, David. Legislatively, the big issue on the table is tax reform, and there is a big question to be answered the tax reform. Uh, is it going to be in the Christmas stocking stuffer? Is this going to get done by Christmas? What's the prediction? Well, we believe it will. Uh, President Trump and I have been working uh, literally around the clock with members of the Senate and before that with members of the House of Representatives. And we really believe that before Christmas comes, uh, we're going to deliver to the American people the largest tax cut in American history. And as the president has said, uh, it's going to be a middle-class miracle. This is tax relief that's going to benefit working families across this country with real and immediate tax relief. The average American family will have more than $1,200 in their pockets when this passes. But, but more than that, um, we, we're going to reform our business taxes in this country so that companies large and small can begin to compete with companies around the world again. And that'll, that'll create jobs. and. We also know that by reducing taxes on businesses, uh, we'll see wages rise in this country. And so uh, we're, we're very close. We're gonna continue to work uh, closely with members of the Senate to move legislation this week. Then it'll be off to what's called a conference committee to work out the differences. But uh, we really do believe uh, that as the president said uh, just yesterday, that uh, uh, the American people are gonna get a great Christmas present this year and it's gonna be a big, beautiful tax cut that'll benefit their families and benefit this growing American economy. Speaking of that economy, what about the, the concern about the deficit? Jeff Flake, uh, Bob Corker, friends of yours who say, hey, wait a minute here, we hope the economy keeps humming, but is there going to be some sort of trigger mechanism that they want to raise rates if the economy doesn't continue to hum? We respect the fact uh, that Members of Congress want to make sure that, that five or six years down the road, uh, if unforeseen circumstances uh, cause a, a, a downturn in the economy, that we make sure and not add a burden of debt to our children and grandchildren. But I think from, from the president on down, we really do believe that by allowing Americans to keep more of what they earn, allowing businesses to be able to reinvest in ways that will create jobs and opportunities, uh, that. Uh, we're not only not going to see deficits from these tax cuts, um, but uh, oh, when they're all fully implemented, we think you're going to see not only incomes rise in this country, our economy grow, but you're also going to see the federal government have even more resources to provide for our military, to meet uh, the obligations that we've made uh, to people through all the various programs. And uh, we, we think this is really all about growth and it's going to result in a growing economy. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. Uh, that was an exclusive interview. You can see part two uh, with the vice president on Monday's 700 Club. They're going to be talking about how evangelical Christians have access to the Trump administration. And we'll take a look at the president's own faith. And they'll look back at tr the Trump administration's first year in office. You can also see excerpts from the interview on CBNNews.com. And the breaking news out of this is uh, uh, moving the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, my prediction on it, uh, and this is coming from Chris Mitchell as well out of uh, our Jerusalem Bureau, is President Trump will not sign the security waiver. 
um, back in 1995 when Congress passed a bill requiring the administration to move uh, the embassy from Tel Aviv uh, to Jerusalem and put in a security exemption, that if it wasn't in the security interest of the United States to move it, uh, the president could every six months sign a security waiver. So what looks like is going to happen is President Trump will not sign that security waiver uh, today and then will appoint a group to oversee the transition and the timing of the transition. So uh, hold on to your hats. It's going to get very interesting uh, in the Arab world over the next few days. Wendy? Very exciting. Thanks, Gordon. Well, up next, it's your chance to see the news behind the news. Caitlin Burke takes us inside CBN's latest behind the scenes podcast right after this. Well, the average American commuter spends almost two hours a day driving to and from work. Millions of these drivers are now turning to podcasts as a way to get news and entertainment while they drive. Well, if you're one of them, CBN News is launching a new podcast just for you. Take a look. The CBN News Daily Rundown is a podcast that brings listeners inside the stories that we at CBN News are working on. Join me as I interview my colleagues. You'll hear behind the scenes information about the topics they're covering and get their take on the top news of the day. Listen into this CBN News original podcast on all your favorite podcast platforms starting December 4th. Well, Caitlin is here with us. She's the host of the CBN News Daily Run Rundown. And Caitlin, I got to start off with what's a podcast? Yes, so that's an important question. A podcast is this generation's talk radio. So you can't watch it. It's audio and you can subscribe and that's what lets you listen to it on the way to work. You can listen to it while you're working out. You can listen to it while you're making dinner. You can listen to it while you're getting ready to go on the show. It is available to you wherever you are. Okay, it's available, but I've got to use a device to get it, right? Yes, so you'll need um, your, your computer so you can subscribe through our website, cbnnews.com or your iPhone or your Android, whatever device you have, there is a podcast app for that. So my smartphone is going to prove I'm dumb again because I don't know <laughs> I don't know how to get a podcast. Yeah, so if you have an iPhone, mm -hmm. then you would go through iTunes. There is an app on I iPhones called Podcast, and you just go through there, type in the CBN News Daily Rundown, and hit subscribe. It sends it to your phone every day every as day, soon as it's posted. I don't mm -hmm. have to think about it anymore. Automatically, but you got to subscribe. If what you if don't I'm subscribe, an Android it won't user? do that. What if I'm Android it comes on Google Play. So that's on your on your Android in the app section. You just go in there, same thing, type in CBN News Daily Rundown, subscribe, and it will come to your phone immediately. Okay. So why why are you doing this? I mean your your television. <laughs> And yes. now you're going into, a, I guess, a new form of radio. Yeah, so I will still be coming to you on the news as a CBN News reporter, but I love having conversations. And I have so many conversations with my colleagues about the stories that I'm working on, the stories that they're working on. And I've realized through those conversations that there's so much that gets left on the cutting room floor. There's so much that we can't include in our stories because it's not relevant to the story. We don't have enough time. There's so many God moments that, you know, it's not relevant to the, the news story, but it's a really cool aspect of what's happening when we're out there. And these are all moments, behind the scenes information, God moments that I can share through this podcast by having conversations with my colleagues and the producers that are working on the top news stories of the day. Okay, how do I join the conversation? If I'm listening to the podcast and I want I want my two cents in there. Yes. How do I do that? So you can go to any of my social media platforms. That's Caitlin Burke CBN News on Facebook or Caitlin K. Burke on Twitter. And I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear questions about some of the stories that you've seen air. Um, I know that as a viewer myself, sometimes I'll think, oh, I wonder how he set up that interview with Mike Pence. I wonder how long it took. And so on our first episode Monday, we'll actually be talking to 
David Brody about the process of setting up that interview. He actually let me know it's been 11 months in the making. They have been trying for so long. So there's and he he told me what uh, the vice president's New Year's resolutions were. So that's something you're not going to see on the interviews that air on the 700 Club. You got to give me a hand. <laughs> I mean, you can't just tease that. You, gotta, you can't. What were the New Year's resolutions? Apparently, he doesn't get very candid. He he's still very scripted for his New Year's okay. resolutions. So they're peace on earth. Yes. Goodwill towards <laughs> men. All right, the Caitlin Burke. You can get the daily rundown. Uh, she told you how to do it. Uh, so if you've got iTunes or you're into Google Play, uh, all you have to do is click on it to subscribe, and then it'll be downloaded automatically uh, forever, uh, and it's Monday through Friday. Uh, so sign up for it. And Caitlin, it's great to have you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Wendy, over to you. Can't wait, Caitlin. I'm working on some exciting stories. We were going to have some fun. So congratulations on the new podcast. Well, up next, he had six kids at home, but he was nowhere to be found. I had a loving family that who cared about me at home. And I'm sitting in a crack house with those addicts. And every time, you know, I wake up, the problem is still there. Hear how a dream delivered him from a 20-year drug addiction when we return. Well, to visit his family and friends, Willie Holloway has to go to the cemetery. Many of their lives were cut short because of drug and alcohol abuse. And as Willie walks tombstones, he knows that he's lucky not to be buried there as well. Some of them OD'd on cocaine. There was one that got shot and lost his life. Uh, some wind up in prison because of selling drugs. Too many of them will die. Some of Willie Holloway's friends have been gone for decades. Others have died more recently. He could have easily ended up like them. Don't be a day go by, I don't think about some of them. And sometimes I find myself at the cemetery, you know, even now, you know, just going down and visiting. Great. Willie grew up in the small town of Neelyville, Missouri. His father was an alcoholic who physically and verbally abused Willie and his siblings. I think to myself, you know, why was I born? You know, why was I born? Was I born to go through this? Uh, what? Why, why am I here? You know, I've seen other, you know, friends of mine that, you know, Nate Fathers seemed like they would take them to, you know, places that, uh, out to eat. Uh, they would take them to, like, little ball games. And, uh, you know, I didn't have that. And I, I, I longed for that. My father never could tell me that he loved me. My mom did, but my father never could tell me that he loved me. Willie's mother took him to church, and he accepted Christ as his savior at 11 years old. His pastor taught him about the unconditional love found through Jesus Christ. That's what I was searching for. I was searching for love. And uh, searching for this, this God that I knew that created this universe. And I wanted to know more about him, and I did know more, begin to know more about him. But it didn't last long. Life at home was hard to cope with, and Willie put aside what happened at church. Alcohol seemed to help him cope. Drinking was uh, 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 my way of escaping. That's the reason I, I drank a lot. I was sad all the time. I mean, I, was, uh, I didn't talk that much. He met Evelyn while in high school, and they got married. They had six children over the next six years. But cocaine and alcohol ruined any chance of Willie being the father he needed to be. The abuse that we endured uh, as children, this followed me. It continued to follow, hunt me. And that's where a lot of my drinking and drugging came from. I, I, I wanted to do this to try to numb it, get, just to forget about it. But yeah, every time, you know, I wake up, the problem is still there. He also had a growing sense of shame that drove him further into addiction. Every time I, I would do cocaine, I felt very, very guilty because I know that I wasn't supposed to be doing this. I had a loving family that who cared about me at home, and I'm sitting in a crack house with other addicts. Over the next 20 years, Willie racked up six DUIs and went to prison twice for violating his parole. He OD'd twice on cocaine, trying to kill himself. After the second attempt, he began to see things more clearly. 
That was the, the, the lowest point in my life when this happened. And then I was ready like, uh, God, I'm tired now. I'm ready to surrender. And uh, the funniest thing happened though is uh, when uh, I laid down one evening, it was like uh, God came to me in the, in the form of a dream. And uh, this place I perceived that was hell that I was in. And I seen faces, but there was one face that was familiar that I seen. And God let me know, this is you. This is where you headed to. Uh, people were screaming in this place. And this is the first time I ever seen anything like this in my life. God was letting me know, this is you. This is where you headed. Willie hadn't been to church in over 20 years, but he went back and told his pastor about the dream. It was the same pastor he had as a kid. He had let me know that, you know, God is trying to get your attention, son. And uh, he let me know that he loved me. And even though I had left the church as a young man, he embraced me. Willie prayed with the pastor that day and rededicated his life to Jesus Christ. I knew that God had put, wrapped his arms around me. I could feel that. I no longer felt like I was bound by chains. And so, that, you know, that's, that's, that's when everything began to fall in place for me. I began to see my family, how the real love that they showed me, the love that they was trying to show me years ago. I began to see this then. That same day, he quit using drugs and alcohol. Willie soon became an ordained minister. By then, his dad was in a nursing home, and Willie started visiting him and telling him about Christ. One time, he found his father in the home's church. He goes, I've turned my life over to God. He said, I know that I'm not going to be here too much more long. And I mean, it brought tears to my eyes to see this could happen. So it was a blessing to see my dad turn to God. Willie was with his father when he died. I forgave him right then and there. I, I, I gave him a hug and told him, you know, that I was, I was happy that he was my father. He held my hand and just squeezed my hand like this and just smile, and I knew what he meant. I knew what he meant. Today, Willie and Evelyn enjoy spending time with their 12 grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. The Bible speaks about those that have their mind stayed on him, and so that's, that's the way it is today. When I wake up, uh, God wake me up of, of mornings, he's the first thing I'm thinking about when I'm awake. I don't think of, no longer think about that drug no more. That drug used to be my God, but now God have replaced it, and he came in and took over. He stepped in my life. And he'll step into yours. Wherever you are, I don't care if you're in a crack house and you're wondering, what am I doing here? Uh, I don't care what happened to you when you were young. I mean, maybe you were like a Willie and you were physically abused. I don't care how far you've gone how far you've run away from God. None of that matters. What matters right now is you saying yes. You don't have to wait for a deathbed to do it. You can do it right now. Because being in a relationship with your Creator is the greatest adventure you can possibly have. It's the greatest life you can possibly have because he came to give you life and life more abundantly. You can see it in Willie's eyes. You know, yes, was he abused as a child? Yes. Was he raised by an alcoholic? Yes. Did he fit the statistical model that, yes, you're going to be an alcoholic too? Yeah. Did he go further? Did he go into cocaine? Yes. But God changed all of that and put him back into his family, made him a loving father, a loving grandfather. And he can do the same thing for you. All you have to do is say yes. He's not looking for much. What he's looking for is some kind of indication that you want him in your life. And once he starts that process, you wake up in the morning refreshed, the first thought on your mind is, God, what can we do today? You don't have to be a slave to alcohol. You don't have to be a slave to drugs. You don't have to be a slave to the pain of your childhood. You can be free. 
For who the Son sets free is free indeed. If you want this, all you have to do is ask for it. It's that simple. It's a very simple prayer. So if you want it, if you want to meet Jesus, if you want to have him in your life, guiding you, directing you, changing you, renewing you, ask for it. So together, let's pray. Just bow your head, close your eyes, repeat after me, and a wonderful adventure awaits at the other side of that prayer. Let's pray together. Jesus, that's right, say his name, say it out loud. Jesus, I come to you today and I want you in my life. I want you in my heart. I want you to guide me, direct me, and show me the way to life everlasting. Lord, forgive me of the things that I've done wrong. Set me free from my past, from the things that have hold of me. Set me free from that. And Jesus, if you'll do this for me, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer, for I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, for those who just prayed, I ask for an infilling of your Holy Spirit. Baptize them in your love and your grace and your forgiveness. And let them know that today their prayer has been heard and has been answered. Do it, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to let somebody know. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. When you call, all you have to do is say, I prayed with that guy on TV and I want Jesus in my life. Uh, we'll send you a free packet. It's called A New Day. And what do you do now? How do you live the Christian life? I encourage you to go through water baptism. I encourage you to join a church. Uh, but it all starts with that, that phone call. Get the packet. There's no financial obligation at all. All you have to do is call, and it's our joy to send it to you free of charge. 1-800-700-7000. Wendy, over to you. Thanks, Gordon. Still ahead, go inside the epic new documentary that shows the miracle behind the nation of Israel. And welcome back to the 700 Club. A surprise, not guilty verdict in the case of an illegal immigrant charged with murdering a woman in San Francisco. 32-year-old Kate Steinle was walking on the San Francisco pier with her father two years ago when she was shot dead. The man holding the gun on the other side of the bullet that killed her was Jose Ines Garcia Zarate, an illegal immigrant with multiple felony convictions who had been deported five times. He was found not guilty after more than a month of testimony and six days of deliberation. We believe the verdict is a correct and accurate reflection of the law and what happened. Garcia Zarate says he found the gun under a chair on the pier and fired it accidentally while handling it. Jurors in the case were ordered not to factor in his immigration status. The case has been at the center of the debate over illegal immigration for the last two years. Operation Blessing is at work on relief and recovery efforts in Puerto Rico, more than two months after Hurricane Maria hit the island. One tiny fishing village called Punta Santiago was nearly destroyed. The storm knocked out all power. Even worse, it crippled the community's prime source of income, fishing. Operation Blessing is helping these fishermen to get back to work. They provided 10 boats and motors to help the men get back on the water. They also installed a reverse osmosis water system to provide the village with safe drinking water. You can learn more about Operation Blessing by visiting its website, ob.org. Gordon and Wendy are back with much more of the 700 Club coming up right after this.
Well, as the head of the house, one grandfather in Cambodia makes sure his family has water, even though he has to take a two-mile walk three times a day to get it. Grandpa Yet lives with his extended family on this small farm in a remote section of Cambodia. They all work together to provide enough for everyone to eat. I'm happy that we live and work together. My family means everything to me. Taking care of the family includes getting water from an open pit well in the next village. It's a two-mile hike that Grandpa Yet makes three times a day. Unfortunately, the water is so polluted, he hesitates even to give it to his animals. The water smells like mud and tastes like iron. His grandchildren often get sick from drinking the water. When that happens, they have to rush them to a community health clinic. I worry about them a lot. It makes me feel so helpless. I'm afraid they will die. I wish I had a clean source of water. So CBN dug a well with a pump right next to Grandpa Yet's home. Now he no longer needs to spend hours a day getting water from the next village. It's right there at his fingertips. Thank you, CBN, for bringing good health and happiness to my family. When you join CBN, you help people like Grandpa Yet with that clean drinking water. Imagine having to walk two miles uh, three times a day just to get clean drinking water for your family. Well, when you become a CBN partner, you help people all over the world with that basic need and so much more. And uh, if you want to know how to do it, it's so easy. You just go to our phones, our number on your screen, toll free 1-800-700-7000. Or you can log on to CBN.com and just say, yes, I want to join the 700 Club. Just 65 cents a day, $20 a month is all it takes to become a CBN partner. When you join, we have a special gift for you right now. It's past new teaching called Ask Anything. These are biblical answers to some of life's most probing questions. And uh, you won't believe some of the questions. You've got to get this. This will be great for your family and your friends. It's our free gift to you when you give us a call right now. Gordon? Well, up next, one filmmaker takes you on an incredible journey to discover the land of the Bible. Go inside the new documentary, I Am Israel, right after this. A brand new documentary has made its way into the Israeli Knesset. It's called I Am Israel, and it tells the story about the rebirth of the Jewish state through the eyes of the people who live there. Take a look. I think I'm privileged to have grown up in a land where my grandfather, where his forefathers only dreamed of seeing built one day. To me, Israel, it's the best proof God exists and still acting in our world. It says, I will bring you in from the four corners of the earth, and people will know that you are my people and that I am your God. God says, mountain, shoot forth your branches, give forth your fruit, my children are coming home. Every fruit you see is prophecy fulfilled. Discover for yourself the miracle of the land and the courageous hearts of the people of Israel. I am Israel. This is home, and home is where you want to be. Well, David Kern is the producer. He's also the editor. He's also the writer. He's also the cinematographer for I am Israel, and he's here now. And David, it's a pleasure having you. Thank you, sir. It's a great pleasure to be here. How did you get involved in this project? What, what was the motivation? So, you know, I've been a, a filmmaker since I was a kid, since I was about 13 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, and I grew up uh, making films, uh, doing things at church. Uh, but as a young adult, God really pressed on my heart to, to tell the stories about what he's doing all over the world and to tell the stories about the great people of faith. Uh, and I'd done a few of these films uh, all over the world in, uh, in India and in Mount Everest and South Africa. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, uh, I was brought to Israel. Somebody brought me over there, the, uh, my co-producer now, Lance McAlinden, uh, because God said, Lance, go to Israel and take David Kern with you. Uh, so I got to go. And 
it was an amazing experience, uh, and it was a personal experience for me. Because as a, uh, I grew up in a Christian home, and I've been a, a believer since I was a, a little kid. Uh, a great, great Christian home, great family. But uh, Israel was never really on my mind so much. I didn't really think about Israel so much. We had a soft spot in our heart for Israel and the Jewish people. But it wasn't something that we thought about so much. And when I went to Israel, it just blew me away. Because I got to see with my own eyes uh, the promises of God uh, being coming into fruition just in our time. Uh, and that was really the, the genesis of, of I Am Israel. Well, you really got into it when I was watching the film uh, yesterday. Uh, you, you tell the story from the eyes of Israelis. You, you know, what motivated them? What was their inspiration both for making Aliyah, returning to Israel, and then living there? Uh, why, why did you choose that as the, I guess, the sort of narrative for it? You, you're telling the story from their point of view. Israel is just a place of, of miracles. And there's the miracle of the land, but there's also the miracle of the people. Uh, and that was one of the things I learned that I really didn't really understand until I went there, uh, that for almost 2,000 years, the Jewish people had been scattered all over the world. And it's only in the last few generations that God has been bringing them back. And so it's really their, their story. Uh, the miracle of, of, the, of the regathering. And when we, when we first went and I interviewed a lot of these people to see what we could do a, a film about, they were all telling me a very similar story. We would meet so many people for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and ask questions. And they would all, they'd all wanna talk about how they came to Israel, mm -hmm. how they came or their parents came or their grandparents came. And they were all telling me the same story. And I realized about a week in that I've heard this story before. I've read this story before. Jeremiah talks about that God says there's going to, become a, there's going to come a time when you guys are not going to talk about Egypt so much. There's going to come a time where you're going to talk about how I brought you from the north and the south and the east and the west. And I realize maybe, maybe I'm actually seeing some of this stuff. One of the things your film brings out, which I think a lot of people don't understand, is that it was actually the return of the people that started the rejuvenation of the land. You know, the promise that the desert would bloom, uh, which, you know, you, you can literally see today in Israel. But the link of the return of the people is the key to why the desert is blooming. It's an incredible. I, that's another thing I learned when I was there is that the Jewish hands and the Jewish feet have been the thing that's made the land come back. Because for uh, almost 2,000 years, many nations came in and they tried to take over and they tried to farm and it never worked. Until the Jewish people came back in the last few generations, it just didn't work. Uh, and, it's, it's, and now it's just the, the most beautiful thing. It, when I went there the first time and I saw how green it was, I realized I didn't know this. I, just personally, I didn't know that this was a beautiful place. And maybe if I didn't know, maybe a lot of people have never seen that before. Well, when you see the old photographs, I mean, any of the photographs from before 1900, any of the photographs uh, even before 1948, you, you, you look at them and you go, that's a wasteland. Right, uh, right, right. There's nothing right. there. And I mean, there are a couple people in the photographs, but it, right, right. there's no green fields. You don't. You don't see the lush that you see today. And it's, it's kind of neat we have those photographs because it shows that God is on the move and we can see proof that, no, you know, in the 1800s, this, this, it was a mess. It was a desert. Um, there's a line in the movie that Yaakov Berg, the, the vineyard owner, says, and he says that, he says, to me, the, to me Israel is the greatest proof that, uh, that God exists and he's acting in our world. And, that, and that's his line. I didn't write that. That's his line. But it really is my worldview. I well, believe tell us that, his story, because I think his story sort of summarizes, you know, how the desert is reblooming. It's, it's interesting. Each character in the movie represents a theme of the rebirth of Israel. Uh, so we have the cowboy who represents the protector of Israel. We have Alex Levine, the best painter in Israel. He represents the rebirth in, of art and culture. Yaakov, the vineyard owner, really re represents the rebirth of the land. Uh, he was not, there had been no, you know, the Bible talks about that in the mountains of Israel, the vineyards will come back. Uh, 
the vineyards will come back in the end times. And for almost 2,000 years, there was no vineyards in the mountains of Israel in, in Samaria. And Yaakov was part of a group of men who were the very first people in 2,000 years to, to su successfully plant vineyards uh, in the mountains of Israel. And uh, he's, he's an amazing man. Uh, he was actually told it's impossible. He had experts well. come in yeah. and say what you're proposing, to, this land cannot support it. Uh, and he had, he had to dig through rock in order to plant that. Right, right, right. And now, and they're now award-winning wines. I mean, they're, it's, it's some of the best wine that anybody would ever have. Uh, one thing that was missing for me, what inspired him to dig through rock? I mean, if I have experts come to me and say, this is impossible, and I look out and I have to dig through rock in order to plant a, a vine, what, what got him to say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and do that? I think because it's in the Bible. It's an amazing thing. There's uh, Yaakov and some of the vineyard owners that I know there in the mountains of, of Israel. Uh, it says it right here in the Bible. It says in, in Ezekiel that there's going to be vineyards here. So let's go. Let's do it. And they did it. And, it's and, and the amazing thing is he invites Christians from all over the world to come and participate in the harvest. That's right. Uh, Hayavel, which was the, the group that hosted me throughout this whole thing, they invite Christians from all over the world to come and be a part of the restoration of Israel, to pick the grapes, uh, and to essentially to be servants, to be servants in Israel. Uh, and Yaakov is a part of that. Uh, and, and so uh, believers have a chance to actually get their hands dirty and, and be a part of the restoration. All right. Well, I invite you to uh, watch this. It's a wonderful DVD, uh, and it's available uh, for download for free to churches. Uh, so how can they get a copy of it? So cbn.com, and uh, uh, there's DVDs and Blu-rays available, but it's also available. Any church in the world can download it and show it for free, and uh, this year and all next year, too. And it's a good time to do it because it's the 70th anniversary of the founding of Israel. And if our uh, news story is accurate, we're going to be seeing uh, the Embassy of America move. So if you want more information, all you have to do is go to cbn.com. Uh, and get a copy of it. I am Israel. I watched it. I was inspired. I know that if you watch it, you'll be inspired as well. Well, we'll be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Welcome back to the 700 Club and happy December 1st, by the way. It is time now for your questions and some honest answers. We're going to start with this one from Robin. She says, I feel my son's constitutional rights were violated. He's now serving a sentence that does not fit the crime. Is it wrong for me to get involved in fighting for my son's rights, even if it means a lawsuit? Robin, it's never wrong to stand up for your children uh, and, and to participate in the legal process. Um, you know, if you need to file an appeal for uh, a criminal conviction, uh, do it. I'm, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see any problem with that at all. Um, yeah, I need to know a little bit more about what you mean by a lawsuit. If you're talking about filing some kind of civil claim, um, you know, that you, you, you need uh, a very good lawyer to take that one on because uh, that's a very difficult road to... to walk down when you're talking about the criminal justice system. Uh, but these are things you can file on appeal, and I encourage people to appeal. If, if you, you feel it's wrong, if you feel that your rights were violated, well, then, then go for it. There's never any problem with uh, defending your children, helping your children. All right. Caroline says, I was raised in a Christian home and was saved at a young age. A couple years ago, I began to fall from my faith. I love God, but I love the worldly things, too. I tend to get in a cycle of making things right for a while, then I fall again. Will there come a point that God will just give up and leave me in my sin if I continue in this cycle? Um, Carolyn, God never gives up, ever. He's got a dream, and, and, and his dream was that he was going to make people in his image, uh, and he, was, he put them in a garden, and he would come down in the cool of the evening and have a good time with them and, and talk with them and fellowship together. That's, that's what he wants. Uh, and, 
You may have given up on that dream. He hasn't given up on that dream. He's still working hard at it. Uh, and he wants to restore all things. He wants to reconcile all things. Uh, and he wants to bring all of this, this present age to a conclusion. So be part of that and realize God is dreaming about you. Mm. Now, if you are having a recurring sin in your life, uh, I, you're not alone. Uh, if you say you don't sin, uh, the Bible says you lie. Uh, the issue is, are you getting better? Uh, there's something from addiction recovery that I'll share with you. Uh, in addiction recovery, they say relapse is part of recovery. Mm -hmm. And it's designed to encourage people who have addictions to realize, okay, you relapse. Now just own that and own that you stumble. Uh, but realize that even though you stumble, the Lord will raise you up. That's the promise of God. He will raise you up. So it's part of your recovery. What did you learn from the relapse? Uh, did, did you learn it was good to sin? <laughs> and the answer is no, it's never good. You feel bad about it. Uh, you don't like that life. You don't like that self that uh, gives into the compulsion. Uh, and uh, so you resolve to do better, and you ask for the Holy Spirit to help you. You ask for Jesus to forgive you, and you pray, for, pray to the Father, restore to me the joy of my salvation. If King David can fall, we all can fall. And just realize that God wants you with him. It's his dream. He sent his son so that you would be saved. That's his will. Uh, just line up your will with that and realize that he'll see you through. He is able to present you spotless and full of joy in his presence on that day. He's able to do that. Trust him that he who has begun a good work in you will finish it. He will complete it. Leave the task to him and just follow. Amen. The goodness of God will yeah. lead us to repentance. Amen. Yeah. God is so good. Great answer. Well, here's one from Richard. He says, for the past five years, I feel like I've been tormented by evil. I've met with counselors and ministers and they tried to help, but eventually all said there was nothing they could do. I finally went to a priest and things got worse, not better. After our meeting, can God forget about me? And another person wondering about that and just let me be tormented by the devil. Richard, you got to be a little more specific. What do you mean by torment? And uh, I, I need to have a little more specifics than just uh, I'm, I'm tormented. Um, you know, what, what really is going on? The Apostle Paul said that there was a messenger from Satan sent to buffet him. And it had to do with the abundance of revelation that he had. Uh, and God, he, he inquired three separate times for it to be removed. And Jesus appeared to him and said, my grace is sufficient for you. I don't know if this is that kind of situation, but don't give up. Um, God has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. Hold on to that plan. Don't hold on to the torment. Here's a word from 1 Corinthians. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. God bless you. We'll see you next week.